So thank you for joining us um, this morning with us. We have artist Tony Foster. Why don't you stand up with them? <laughs> one of Tony's extended team members, Ann Baxter. Uh, we're going to have a little conversation with Tony. And, uh, and when we finish in here, I'd like to go to the gallery for a few minutes, and if you have questions you'd like to, you know, pose about particular works. Have you all seen the exhibit at this point? No. Yes. No? No. Okay. We're going to go see Dr. Talk. I believe you're first there. Right. So I've had the immense pleasure of following Tony's work for uh, just about 40 years now. Uh, I know. Um, in, in round numbers. Yes. Uh, and uh, Tony is not just an artist, he's a, a great adventurer and quite dauntless and in his adventures. He's traveled to some of the most beautiful and remote places on the earth. He's backpacked, climbed, rafted, and the current exhibit is, is work from journeys, several journeys he's made to the Mount Everest region, around Mount Everest, uh, from Nepal and Tibet, and uh, from various remote locations in the Grand Canyon. And uh, it, it's a pretty tough job. Somebody has to do it, and Tony's the guy. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tony and Anne, and uh, we're going to have a, a great time here this morning. So thank you for joining. Thank you. I'm Ann Baxter, the arts manager at the Foster in Palo Alto, and I'm honored to be here with Tony talking about his uh, journey here. We're very grateful to the Museum of Northern Arizona for reuniting 22 of the 35 artworks in Tony's 12th journey, the Searching for a Bigger Subject, Watercolor Diaries of Everest in the Grand Canyon, which Tony undertook from 2004 to 2008. The museum has brought together artworks from collections in Texas, Idaho, California, and Washington to achieve this, and we are very thankful to those who have loaned the artworks to make this possible. It is sometimes difficult for collectors to make this decision, but it is a valuable one because it is so powerful to see the journey as one again. And it's a treat to have Tony here in Flagstaff to reflect on and delve into this inspired undertaking and the resulting work. As you can see, we're recording this conversation and only if it's good, I promise, it will be available for future viewing and sharing on the Foster's YouTube channel and on our website and via our monthly newsletter. Let's see. So to set the stage, Tony, so to speak, what were you up to in 2002, 2003, right before you began searching for a bigger subject? Um, well, this, the, these two paintings here uh, are paintings from, when do we say, 2002. Uh, and so this is just before I set out to paint Everest and the Grand Canyon for the show that's here at the moment. Um, the painting on the left, Kaichua Falls, uh, which is a, a, a beautiful waterfall in Guyana, um, an 800 foot single drop waterfall with an enormous river rushing over it. Um, and I, I was, that was part of an exhibition I was doing called Watermarks. I should explain that all my, all my exhibitions are thematic. In other words, I choose a theme and work on it for three or four years at a time and then finally launch uh, an exhibition which, which encompasses everything I can produce about a particular project or a particular idea or a particular theme. And in that case, the theme was called Watermarks, uh, and it was water in all its forms, from, from the uh, boiling, uh, what you call geysers, and we call geysers, uh, in Yellowstone, through to the frozen icebergs in Greenland. So, uh, and I, I painted under, I worked underwater, I, I painted waterfalls, I painted streams, I painted oceans, water in all its forms. And that was one example uh, of uh, uh, a painting from that exhibition. The one on the left um, was uh, a, a journey I did down the Salmon River in Idaho. I have a, a, a very um, a formidable group of friends in, in Ketchum, Idaho, uh, who I've traveled with all over the world. 
and uh, they, are, uh, they too are what Alan has just called dauntless. Uh, and uh, I, I asked them if it would be feasible to, uh, to travel the entire length of the Salmon River, 415 miles. Uh, and so I went up into the, into the Sawtooth Mountains to where the river is simply a little drip coming out of the rocks. And then I walked down for two or three days, three days I think, until I got uh, doing a painting every day, until I got to Busterback Bridge, where it was wide enough to put on uh, a little um, rubber ducky. So we sat in rubber duckies and off we went. And then the river widened and we put on a sport boat and so on. And we carried on down the river for 27 days. And I did a painting every day and that, and that formed a complete exhibition. So that's two things that I was doing before I set out on this particular project. And why were you searching for a bigger subject? Why? Oh, <laughs> well, I guess, um, I suppose I got to... This is a photograph of Tony at the rim oh. of the Grand Canyon. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, there I am searching, I suppose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we put this up because I suppose the point is that what a lot of people perhaps don't realize is that these, these works are largely resolved on, are resolved on site. And although they're enormous, some of them, uh, nonetheless, you, you can see my equipment. There's my folding drawing board, my aluminu alu aluminum <laughs> tube, uh, you call them aluminum, um, uh, and strapped onto my backpack. And I set off, that's how I set off in order to start painting. And I suppose I'd got to a stage in my life where I'd done some fairly major pieces on, on site, but I was wondering whether, in I was trying to push that to its extremes, really. I was getting ambitious, and I thought, I wonder if it's actually feasible to do a painting you know, of, of, of really substantial size on site. Because most people, when they think of painting on site, they think of something you know, 10 inches by 12 or 10 inches by 14, you know, a little sketch which takes an hour or two. Whereas I've been working on things which might take two or three weeks on site to just to do one painting. Uh, and, and so I was going to try and find that, uh, try and find uh, a sort of ambition of doing some six foot paintings. That was basically the, the, the thing that drove me. Um, but what finally crystallized it in my mind was I was actually hiking in the Grand Canyon. I've been to the Grand Canyon many, many times. And I was hiking in the Grand Canyon and I found a little plastic water bottle, cheap plastic water bottle in a little, a little plastic case or a little cloth case, and somebody had dropped it, uh, and on the side of it, it said Mount Everest. And I thought, that is extraordinary. What is, <laughs> what is this, this souvenir? You know, it hadn't been to Mount Everest, certainly. It wasn't, it wasn't of the caliber that would go to Mount Everest. But, but Mount Everest sums up in people's minds sufficient to make it seem like an adventurous thing to have on your belt. Uh, and in fact, I found out later you can buy them in Babbitts, or used to be able to <laughs> buy them in Babbitts with the, with the Mount Everest symbol on them. And I thought, wow, that would make a fantastic exhibition, comparing the world's two greatest landscape icons and trying to do gigantic paintings of both on site. Uh, the world's highest mountain, the world's greatest canyon. And so that was really how, you know, an idea that can take you three or four years can emerge just from the merest coincidence. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to add, you seem to be drawn to the Grand Canyon, uh, with it being the subject of your fourth journey, exploring the Grand Canyon, where you painted 48 artworks over four major trips wow. of a month's duration each, from 1988 to 1989. And you've done three studies of uh, river trips going down the Colorado River, painting a watercolor every day of those journeys. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the largest painting you've ever painted is at the Foster right now. It's just the watercolor portion of the artwork is four feet by seven feet, and their souvenirs and whatever attached was probably five by eight or six by eight feet or something. And uh, then you've done other paintings too. So how did you come to first want to explore the Grand Canyon? What brought you to this place and what brings you back again? Yeah, um, well, I, I had a very great friend. Unfortunately, he died about uh, th four, five, six years ago, uh, called Bill Brace. And he was the head of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, MIT. And he and I had hiked quite a bit together. Uh, he, he just liked being out in the back country. Um, and one day he said, you know, you ought to paint the Grand Canyon. And I said, no, nah, I'm not really interested in that. 
And he, sa he said, why not? And I said, well, it's already been painted by masters uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of times, hundreds of times, and it's been photographed millions of times. There's absolutely nothing new to say about the place. And, <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll pay for your trip to the Grand Canyon, and we'll go down into the canyon for a couple of days, and uh, we'll explore a little bit, and if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me back. So I said, oh, OK, great, free trip to the canyon. <laughs> um, and so he and I went to the canyon. We went down, uh, halfway down, down onto the Tonto platform, walked along the Tonto for a little way, uh, didn't even bother to bring a tent. Um, it poured with rain. I, uh, we, I slept, I can remember now, I, I slept stretched out across a boulder and with the rain pouring down on my head, trying to get to sleep. In the morning, I did a kind of really desultory, miserable little painting, which actually I've still got. Um, and, and then we squelched our way back to the top in pouring rain. And it was the most dismal experience of my life. And I was absolutely hooked. <laughs> <laughs> and what I realized at that point, of course, was that you look at the canyon from the South Rim village. And you know, it's just ice cream parlors and, and, and uh, you know, all the usual stuff that people have to have when they arrive by car. Uh, but when you go down into the canyon, there are places of extraordinary, discreet beauty and, and places where you see, seldom see anybody at all. And, and that's what hooked me, because I just loved this idea of solitude, wilderness and beauty combined together. And so I was hooked, and I don't know how many, I must have done hundreds of paintings of the canyon, I suppose, or certainly a hundred anyway. Um, and, and so it's, it's a place that's very dear to my heart. So now we're starting on this journey. So that led to uh, planning for what ended up being four trips to the Grand Canyon and three trips to paint Everest from both the Nepal and Tibet sides over five years. And that's a pretty immense project. And uh, we wanted to hear how you implemented it. How did you start out with the pre-planning and the logistics? And um, how did you choose these particular painting sites? Well. Uh, God, that's a hell of a question. Um, how did I do the planning? Um, well, I'm very fortunate in my friends. Um, I have, over the last 35, 40 years, I've collected about me a bunch of people who aren't scared of adventures. And I have a, uh, my address book, and I go through it, and I think, who, were I, who I wonder would like to come to Everest for six weeks? Uh, and I go through it, and I make a few phone calls, and... I say, hey, do you fancy coming to Everest for six weeks? And I generally manage to gather around me a bunch of people who, who are prepared to do it. I also have friends who've been to Everest many times. And so they then say, the Sherpa you want to talk to is Ang Nerbu Sherpa. And they give me the Sherpa's address. And I get onto the Sherpa and say, I want to come to do some paintings uh, for about six weeks. I need to go up to the southwest face, um, southwest base camp. Can you organize that for me? And then he says, yes, but of course it's very expensive. And so then I put together a bunch of six people who will share the cost. We just share the costs of the expedition, and, uh, and basically off we go. And my work really is about what I can find as I travel. I don't identify sites before I start. I, I try not even to look at photographs before I start, because I want to be taken by surprise by what I find. And so. Uh, I don't do much research, really, um, except I might read books by people who've, who've traveled in Everest, that kind of thing. I don't mind that. But what I don't want to do is identify sites. And the canyon is the same. I'm lucky that I have good friends who have been with me for many years as friends in the canyon. I've got two of them sitting in the audience here. Um, and, and so I've got, I, I know people. And that's the key to it, knowing people. And so I then... Uh, Bill Brace, for example, came to the canyon with me many times. And so he was always up for a trip to the canyon. He loved the place. I had a friend, Parker Huber, who I'd first met many years before, and he came with me several times. And generally, I could find people who would want to come to, come to the canyon for a week, a month. However long I was going to be there, I could usually find people who would come. And, and so it all depends on my friends, really. Um, my job is simply to paint. Their job is to keep me alive. <laughs> It's worked so far, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so plan where you're going generally, and then how do you um, 
accommodate for painting in these extreme conditions, the very high altitude, dry weather, uh, what accommodations do you make in your on uh, site? Well, I suppose, I suppose what's evident here is that the whole process is pretty rudimentary. Um, anybody who's ha hiked will know how much you resent every single ounce you have to carry. Uh, and so if you were to add to your backpack, you know, you've already got your tent, your sleeping bag, your stove, your food, your water. That's enough really, isn't it? Uh, and then you have to add your painting equipment to that. So you have to add a folding drawing board, an aluminium tube, the paper, the paints, and everything you, that you're going to need for a month in the canyon. And so... Um, Do you have your watercolors? Watercolors. Yeah. I'll show you my watercolors. Those of you who haven't seen them, um, this is my watercolor paint box. So try to cut down on everything you have to carry. <laughs> I cut the handle off my mug. I cut the handle off my toothbrush. I cut all those little um, labels off the tea bags. I do anything to save, <laughs> anything to save a quarter of an ounce. And, and in this case, of course, the only paint box I ever use both in the studio and on site, is this little tiny one which is smaller than a packet of cigarettes. It's the Winsor Newton Bijou number two. Um, and it certainly is Bijou. There are 24, I think, colors inside there. Are there is that yeah. right, 24? Um, 24 colors. Uh, and the combinations that you can make out of those are just infinitesimal. And so um, that's all you need. Uh, if you're starting out as a watercolorist, don't get carried away by a, a watercolour paint box the size of a piano <laughs> keyboard. You don't need it. That's all you need. Um, and so in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the case of the painting that I was doing on Point Sublime, um, I erected an easel out of bits of old, bits of tree, the fallen tree that I'd found. I had a little saw with me. Uh, I sawed off bits of, bits of tree, lashed it all together like a five bar gate, strapped my drawing board to it. That's a six... That's a six foot by three foot drawing board, um, which had been folded up on my backpack. Uh, my stool, uh, there's the paper lashed to the, lashed to the drawing board with bulldog clips. Um, and there's the tube there, of course. And there's the painting sort of halfway resolved. Uh, so you can see how the process works. It's, as I say, it's very rudimentary, uh, simple really. Uh, and the whole process is exactly the same on Everest, except the only difference is that you need gin to put in your paint water. Because, of course, the paint water will freeze. And to, so stop it freezing, you just add gin to it. But otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, the process is exactly the same. I want to point out something you can't see in these pictures, but the drawing board, that's a key. It's more impactful than taking the labels off the tea bags, though Tony does drink tea about every two hours, so that is a lot of tea bags. But, that adds <laughs> up. but the, um, the that's a two-ply two ply plywood um, folding board, and he has carved out the back of it, so it is very lightweight. It's just one ply um, as much as possible, so it's as light as it can be, but it can accommodate his large, large artworks. And the palette is a plastic uh, cover of an ice cream. Yeah, Tupperware. <laughs> yeah, it's a Tupperware, Tupperware yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I was wondering about the, the water and um, you're talking about evaporation and the problems just with the weight of the water and you need so much water in the Grand Canyon. And um, talking about the thing about the insects and the problem with that. Oh, well, yes, I mean, the, yes. I mean, there are problems with, with whatever you're painting, no, no doubt about it. But in the canyon, of course, because it's so dry, when you put a wash on in order to do a, a big sky, all the insects are, uh, can detect that immediately. And they all, they all land on the, pap on the paper and you have to you have to sort of paint the sky round the butterflies and, <laughs> and, and, and the insects that have all landed to suck up the water off the paper. But so that's, I mean, yeah, that's a sort of delightful problem really yeah. because, you know, you're, you're assisting nature. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. okay uh, that's the painting I was doing, yes. Yeah. What, what mm -hmm. am I supposed to say about it? Just describe it. Why oh, okay. did you choose this side? And okay. About this <laughs> I keep forgetting, uh, yeah, um, yeah. My, forgetting my prompts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in this case, this was the painting I was doing on site. This is six feet by three um, at, on Point Sublime. Um, I was there for uh, 13 days doing that painting. And in fact, interestingly, the, um, the director of the, of the uh, National Park on the, north, on the North Rim, which is sort of rather independent from the South Rim, they pride themselves on their independence, um, you're only allowed really to camp at Point Sublime for two days. 
But I said, look, I'm going to need longer than that. Is there any way I can stay longer? And he said, yeah, OK, we'll enrol you as a voluntary ranger. Um, <laughs> and his assistant, who was rather horrified by this idea that you could suddenly enrol me as a voluntary <laughs> ranger, um, said, well, what are we going to... Voluntary ranger doing what? And he said, interpretation. <laughs> and, and I thought that was a very clever response. But anyway, um, and so that painting was probably two-thirds resolved on site and a third resolved back in my studio. Um, the glass tube that you see along the bottom there, that's a glass tube. Um, and I like the idea of sort of explaining the canyon's history as best I could. So, um, and so that is full of um, rocks pounded from the Grand Canyon. I know you're not allowed to do this. I'm going to explain this in a minute. You're not allowed to take rocks from the Grand Canyon. But I will explain how I do that. Uh, and it starts with the Kaibab limestone on the left-hand side and goes through all the different layers of the canyon until you get to the Zoroaster granite at the bottom. Um, and so that's the kind of history of the Grand Canyon in a glass tube. Uh, and then the, the uh, uh, aspen leaves um, are because while I was there, the, the climate changed, really, from, <coughs> from summer through to autumn. Uh, and I wanted to describe the idea of the changing time. And so the, uh, the idea of of painting uh, leaves turning from brilliant green through to yellow, through to orange, through to a purpley red uh, seemed like a good way to describe time passing uh, while I was sitting there doing the painting. And Tony usually includes a map. Early on it was like a hand-drawn topo map, but it's a topo map noting the place where he was recording that. Yeah, so if anybody wants to to travel in the same my footsteps, footsteps why, why the hell would you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you'll find a little tiny piece of a topo mat which you can ma match up if you're, if you're clever. Mm -hmm. This artwork is now in the permanent collection of the Phoenix Art Museum. And Tony's already mentioned it's so important uh, the guides and companions that he travels with. And here are some photographs of different experiences. Here he is at Point Sublime painting that painting that we've just seen, and also um, in Tibet and Nepal on some of those trips. And um, how do the companions help you? They bring in supplies, cheer you up, cook you good meals, or? Uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, <laughs> say anybody ever cooks a good meal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, people do cook, um, but generally speaking, of course, we use dehydrated, where you just, we just uh, add hot water and leave it on a rock for ten minutes and then eat it. So cooking doesn't really enter into it. But, but um, certainly without my companions, none of this stuff could have been done. Um, and uh, you see the solitary artist walking out there, but the solitary artist behind him has got a team of. Uh, let's think. In that case, there's a team of um, a yak driver, five yaks, uh, a yak driver's assistant, a cook, a cook's assistant, um, six or eight porters, uh, four Sherpa guides, and a Sirdar. Altogether, about if you include the six of my friends, that's probably about 25 people and five yaks. So that solitary adventurer there is <laughs> <laughs> not so solitary as he yeah. looks. Um, and uh, and this, this bunch here is a mixture of, of all those people. Uh, we've just come down from painting the east face of Everest, which was a pretty grim experience. Uh, and we're now down at uh, about uh, 14,000 feet and feeling delighted that we've actually got back down from painting the east face of Everest. So everybody's throwing their hats in the air. Uh, and this one here is me painting at Point Sublime with my friend Pam Fraser, um, who has just come to rescue me with her husband John, um, because I've been there now in, on the North Rim for no, uh, 19 days, I think, uh, without seeing many people. I saw my friend Kurt for the first six, then he skedaddled, and I was there on my own for 13 days, and Pam and John came to rescue me and took me home and fed me a good meal. So, so it's, all about, it's all about my friends, really. Mm -hmm. I think noteworthy is they're, they're lifelong friends. They either have been you know, originally friends and then are just deeper friendships develop over the journeys, or people who have joined you have just stayed in touch and gone on repeated journeys to different parts of the world. And that's telling with the Sherpa families, too, because Tony's traveled and been um, involved with a couple of generations from these families now. And they support Tony 
you know, standing by him when he's doing his watercolors and helping out in uh, near Everest. And also he supported them when there was a major earthquake in Nepal in 2015. Tony made a jacle of uh, the watercolor you'll see a little bit later from Kalapatar, the high, uh, at 17,820 feet, he painted that and sold the jacle as a fundraiser to help uh, people in need in Nepal after the devastating earthquake there. So he keeps connections with people in both in many ways. And uh, this is a painting Tony wanted to share about companions because uh, oh, yes. he uh, was reflecting on it. Let me explain. Um, you probably can't even see it, but across that uh, middle ground, little snow bank there, there's just a little tiny trace of a trail. Can you see that? Yeah. Well, I was sitting in a snowbank uh, doing, that, doing that painting, and, um, and then the phone went off. No, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, funnily enough, it, uh, Kurt did have a sat phone with him at that time, I remember, and, and I remember phoning my wife. But anyway, that was different. Um, so I was sitting in a snowbank doing that painting, and walking... Uh, um, all my team had set off to get to the next camp where we were going to get camp next where I was going to do my next painting and they all of them were walking like little from the distance we were at they were like little dots on the snow or little ants walking along some of the porters loaded down of course the yaks loaded down my friends carrying the, you know whatever they carry and they were strung out right across that path and I can remember thinking what a completely absurd way to make a bunch of watercolors. <laughs> this, this just does not make any sense whatsoever that I come back from these places with, with a bunch of half resolved, no, completely resolved, but nonetheless not finished paintings. And I couldn't do any of it without that entire crowd of people. And the logistics involved, the people involved, the, the, the money involved, the time involved. And I just thought, I don't, I don't understand either why people are drawn into this process so much that they're prepared to go through all this hardship in order to be with me and help. Um, and I just, I just felt very humbled by that and by the fact that, that what seemed, always seemed at the time to be very um, minimal results from such major output. Uh, and so it was just something that struck me while I was sitting doing that little painting. Why did you choose those souvenirs? Oh, uh, well, um, uh, what I try with these, with the things that I attach to my paints, I try, and try to say something more about the place than simply what it looks like. My paintings aren't just about putting a, a kind of a metaphorical frame around a particularly choice piece of landscape and copying it. They're much more about trying to explain what it's like to be there, who you encounter, what the weather's like, uh, you know, uh, all, the, all the adventures that you have if you go on a journey like this. And in this case, of course, the, the, the Buddhist um, philosophy was absolutely uh, um, germane to the entire enterprise. The, the, the Sherpas are profound Buddhists and they are the most marvelous, marvelous people to travel with. And, and so all of, I think all of the Everest paintings contain some, some um, reference to the, to the Buddhists. And in this case, it's a piece of a prayer flag uh, a little Buddhist uh, symbol, or two little Buddhist symbols, really, uh, along with the map. And, and, uh, and all of them have that kind of thing attached to them, to say something about the, the, uh, the way that the, the Buddhist philosophy overrules absolutely everything. Now, you've said the smaller paintings that you paint tell the story of the search for the bigger subjects. Oh, mm. This is one of the extreme cases. You spent 13 days searching for this site and uh, then 11 days working on it on site. And um, wanted to hear a little bit about what was it about this site after all those days that compelled you? Did you just give up or was there something particular <laughs> about that? <laughs> Does it just look companion. like I just gave up? I, <laughs> I hope not. Um, um, yes, uh, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, when people come to the, or when people think about it, they think, if you want to do a big painting of the Grand Canyon, all you have to do is go to the edge and look, because after it's so vast, that there's bound to be a big painting there. Well, I haven't found that, uh, not in my experience. I've found that the, the bigger the painting, the longer it takes you to find the perfect site. If you're going to commit yourself to something which in this case was going to take 11 days sitting in one place, 
it's got to be something pretty spectacular. Um, and so I wanted, of course, if possible, to have the river in it somewhere, which rules out a lot of the bits of the canyon because you can't see the river from that many places. Um, and I wanted it to have a decent middle ground, a decent foreground. I didn't want too much of, the, of that, uh, that grey um, scree slope that you get around the Tonto area because that can be rather boring in a big painting if you're not careful. Um, and so it had to have all sorts of things to make it work. And in this case, my friends, um, I think two or three of them at a time, came with me. Uh, we, we would look at the map. I'd say, well, I think I'm going to find what I need towards the west end of the canyon. So we'd go off into the wild parts of the canyon. We'd walk out onto some, onto some um, major headland, often which didn't have any trail onto it at all. So we'd scramble our way through the cactus and cat's claw and, and bushes to the edge of some abyss. I'd look down after two days struggling to get there, and I'd say, sorry guys, this just doesn't work. <laughs> and, and then I would do a small painting. And they're painting. still friends. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd do a small painting, and we would turn around and go back again to where we'd started from, move along a little bit, go down, back on another mesa. We'd look at the map. I'd say, I think that ought to work. We could see down here and so on. Uh, and then again, it just didn't. Uh, I'd get to the end, and I'd go, God, no, sorry, this one won't work. So that process went on for 13 days. And by that time, some of my pals had left, other ones had joined us. Uh, and so I had this shifting population of people who went away feeling completely fed up because <laughs> we hadn't actually found what we were supposed to be looking for. And on the 13th day, uh, I edged my way along the rim of the canyon where there was no trail and uh, sort of right on the edge and then came to a little flat spot where I could put a tent up and looked and this was what I saw. I mean, it's just got everything that I possibly could want for a painting. It's got a, a good middle ground. It's got an eye catcher in the middle ground. It's got the river leading into the distance. It's got, uh, you know, it's just got everything I wanted. And so I said, this is it. Now this is it. And so then we had to set up uh, a camp for 11 days with 11 days water, because there's no water there. So everybody needs a gallon of water a day. Um, all our food for 11 days and so on. So people were coming and going bringing stuff to me in order to keep me going. And, um, and Kurt, uh, one of my um, companions, arrived right at the end, or two days before the end. I was just finishing. And he uh, dragged me out of there uh, with all my equipment. So it, it was a huge process in order to make this one painting. Yeah, I don't think I said. The watercolor is about three feet by six feet, but the entire frame piece is about four and a half feet by seven feet, including the inscription and the watercolor souvenirs. So of course Tony has the map showing where he is and the uh, sediments. And can you describe uh, why you painted the Oh, the arrowheads. The arrowheads? Well, I always think about the canyon that, that one of the things about it is that it is basically empty. But it didn't used to be. It had a thriving uh, tribal culture. Uh, now that only they have a supai who, who still live in the canyon, one, one tribe. Um, but that thriving culture uh, has been dispersed and, um, and, and some of them removed from the canyon uh, and some of them just left. Um, but nonetheless, it has this enormous history of occupation by, by tribal people. And so uh, I wanted to really make a note of that. And so I went to a work in the Grand Canyon Museum store. Uh, I blagged my way in and I said, can I borrow some of your stuff? I want to do a, a strip of paintings of arrowheads, which are referring to the tribal cultures that once inhabited the canyon. So I, I just wanted to point out that it didn't always belong to the National Park Service. <laughs> so hmm. another point for undertaking such a journey to extreme places is that things all, don't always go as planned. And so we have a couple of slides to show that. Um, this painting is shown in the gallery right down the hall here at the museum. And that was a very momentous painting for Tony, which resulted in he's, the, he's actually in that red tube because um, he had pulmonary and um, cerebral edema after being at that high elevation for so long. So he's pressurized. But he thinks this is one of his greatest paintings. So um, 
like you to comment on that. Yeah, I, did, I, I didn't think so at the time. I thought it was a catastrophe <laughs> um, because I had been painting it, and my I, I realized, began to realize that uh, all my what happens when you get um, edema is that all your everything swells up. Your brain swells up, which is what gives you cerebral edema, uh, and your um, lungs are pressurized, so blood forms in your lungs, which gives you pulmonary edema. Uh, and all, everything swells up, your hands swell up, your feet swell up, you don't make good decisions because your brain is in bad condition, or it's swollen up. Uh, and I can remember thinking, on, on about the third, fourth day, I think, I can remember thinking, REI sold me a pair of small gloves when I needed medium-sized gloves. <laughs> and I'd been wearing them uh, you know, up until that point, but I suddenly couldn't put them on anymore. I could hardly put my boots on, uh, my face was all swollen up. Um, and it was obvious that I was beginning to suffer badly from from edema. Um, I, I didn't know that's what I was suffering from, but I knew I was feeling pretty sick. Uh, and so I um, walked down with a friend of mine, walked down to 14,000 feet. This was up at 17,600 feet. Uh, I walked down to 14,000 feet where there is a Porter's Rescue Clinic uh, because Porter's get um, uh, mountain sickness too, uh, not just hikers. Um, and they put me into this thing called a Gamow bag, um, and this is a Sherpa pumping it up with a foot pump so that, it, so that the pressure rises, so you're, it's as if you've suddenly gone down to 8,000 feet. And they then pump in oxygen and um, uh, uh, hydrocortisone. Uh, um, and uh, the young man sitting there making notes is a doctor from New Zealand, a, a volunteer doctor. These places are always run by volunteer doctors. Um, and he'd seen me coming down the hill, and I, he could see that I was in bad condition. And he came up and said, you better get straight into the clinic. Um, and he put me in there, put me back on my feet. And um, after some time living in there, which I loved, it was so nice and warm, and <laughs> it fe felt safe and cozy. Um, anyway, he finally they unzipped it and helped me out. And he said, now you've got to get further down. Um, and there was a little hill, just, it, was, it was in a sort of bowl, this place. And I said, well, I, OK, but I'm not sure I can get up that hill. He said, I'll come with you and just make sure you're OK, and otherwise you might have to come back and stay here for a while. But anyway, I managed to get back up, up the little hill and then started down to 13,000 feet. Um, and gradually, well, I was going to say I recovered, but I didn't really. He never told me that I should go down to 8,000 feet. He simply said, you've got to go down. And so I went down to 13,000 feet. And then, having kind of had a day off, then started another big painting, um, which didn't go very well. I think that's the next slide, isn't that it? That is. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something about the souvenir of the prayer flag? Oh, if you like, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that um, there is what they call a kata, a silk kata. And, and the Buddhists, when you leave, um, they hang sil a silk, silk katas around your neck as a symbol of, of affection and respect. Um, and when I left, each time, uh, each time I left Nepal or, or Tibet, uh, I would have half a dozen of those hanging around my neck. So I've incorporated them into my, into my paintings. And they're tied, uh, rolled up and tied up with little bits of prayer flags. That's right, yeah. yeah. So this was the painting I started down at, um, I think, about 13,500 feet, something like that. But I was still feeling pretty bad because I, should, I hadn't realized, but I should have gone down to 8,000 feet. And, um, not only that, but I also developed an abscess under my tooth. And my face had swollen up, I'd closed one eye. Uh, and I was still suffering with the altitude sickness, really. Um, and then, the, this, then, luckily, in a way, the abscess burst. Um, and, and at least it wasn't so painful. But of course, I was then suffering from the poison in my system. Um, and so I said to the Sherpas, look, I'm sorry, but I've got to go. I've got to go home. And I actually went home two days early. And they were so disappointed by this idea that I, you know, the thing had been a bit of a failure, that I said, look, I, I will come back next year and finish this. Uh, but of course, I don't suppose they believe that, because everybody says that. Um, but anyway, that's, so that's what I did. And I went back the following year and worked on that painting in order to get it finished enough to, to get it back to the studio. But of course, when he went back the following year, uh, late in April, he went back to this exact site, and when he 
got there with his group, it was covered in snow. So he w continued around for another week or two and then came back and the snow had melted and he was able to complete it. That's true, yeah, yeah. This is in the gallery also on exhibit. This is about four and a half by seven feet, a large painting. So we've talked about the souvenirs and the watercolors and the inscriptions are another important part of Tony's artwork. He uh, keeps a diary while he's um, on site and then takes parts of that and uh, carefully records them on the mats or on the artwork. And we copied a couple of these so Tony can read them and you yeah. can learn of his experience. Well, I suppose you can read them too, but for those of you that can't read them at the back, um, <laughs> the one on the left is a Grand Canyon painting from Ruby Point. Um, and it says, cold camping at Ruby Point, the tent covered with frozen snow. Painting in the early morning light, the paint freezes on the paper at 26 degrees Fahrenheit. Never thought to bring gin. So, you know, I just wouldn't normally, of course, go to Everest. I always take it, but, but to the Grand Canyon, it didn't seem necessary. Um, on a hike to Huxley Terrace, I find, find a perfect smooth stone axe head eight, in, eight inches long and leave it in place. Um, I want to explain something about the souvenirs. Uh, I did say a little earlier that, um, that uh, you know, you're not allowed to take rocks out of the Grand Canyon and you're certainly not allowed to take any uh, arrowheads or, or st stone tools that you might find. And so um, what, I, what I do, it, to, in order to get the rocks to, to do these little, um, these little history of the Grand Canyon in rock kind of thing, uh, it, that, that one's a tiny one in a little glass tube, uh, a test tube, um, I've made friends with the Grand Canyon geologists. And of course, they've got piles of rocks. Uh, and so they just give me one or two or three rock, little tiny stones from each level of the canyon. So that's a legitimate, a legitimate use of the material as far as, as far as the canyon authorities are concerned. Uh, and the arrowheads that I uh, incorporate are all made, or were all made for me by an, uh, a Navajo master ar arrowhead maker uh, called Homer Etherton who was 80 years old, and the, and the arrowheads he made were more like jewelry than, than weapons. I mean, they were just beautiful, beautiful things. Uh, and he did say, because I would, I would order, once I met him and explained what I wanted, he would, he, I would just order them from him and he would post them to me in England. And, uh, and he did say, these are the last ones I will ever make because my wrists are giving out. So those are very special arrowheads. Uh, this other one here, this, this one here, of course, is uh, uh, when we're going to the east face of Everest. And it says, during brief moments between blizzard and low cloud, I emerge to draw and paint. The subject never clear, I work as best I can. The camp subdued, my friends, my friends stoical, the yak drivers concerned, and the yaks dejected. <laughs> And they were. You could see these poor old yaks. It was in deep snow. They were constantly <laughs> scraping at the snow trying to find something to eat. And in fact, we had to leave there a day before we expected because although we'd, we'd been through blizzards, we'd been through all sorts of things, there was one young man, young Tibetan, very, very poor, probably 16 years old. His only possession was his one old yak. And he'd come with us. All the other yak drivers said, well, I don't know if this yak going to make it, but, uh, but he does need the money. And so he came. His yak was very lightly loaded. Uh, and, but, but this poor old yak didn't look as if it was going to survive much longer being up at that altitude. And so we left a day early in order to get this yak back, back down again, really, rather than we needed to go, but the, but the yak did. <laughs> and, so, and so luckily the yak survived, and, and he was paid off. the young man was paid off, and he was very happy. So that worked out OK. These two smaller paintings are part of the exhibition here at the museum. And um, the one on the right is one of my favorite paintings. It shows such emotion, um, and it's just a beauty jewel of a little painting. And it was done just unplanned while he was waiting for the skies to clear so he could paint another subject. But he um, was inspired in his tent, even. And I wouldn't say I was inspired, I'd say I was bored. I just, <laughs> I just needed to do something. I'd read all, my, I read all the books, I'd read everybody's books, and I had nothing else to do. So, so. <laughs> so, uh, and then the souvenirs on the right, there's a Buddha with, um, wrapped in something. And, oh, okay, and yeah. Wax totally, yeah. Um, yes, now the thing about the um, Chinese occupation of Tibet, Tibet is that, of course, the Buddhist um, 
uh, philosophy, uh, the Chinese have been trying to suppress it ever since they evaded. And, and so in that case, there's a little, um, a little terracotta Buddha wrapped up in a Chinese newspaper and sealed with Chinese, a Chinese seal. Um, uh, but the Buddha is still peeping out or bursting out from his wrappings. And my thought is that I, I hope that the, the Chinese will never succeed in actually finally um, doing away with Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and so th the idea is that I hope that I don't think, I think it will always survive in some form. Uh, I certainly hope so. And so that's a symbol of that, really. Here's the photograph of Tony up at Kalapatar on his second trip to Nepal in 2006. He's at a very high elevation, 17,820 feet. And he just was working on the painting that's in the center below. Uh, and then uh, Tony has a comment about the, the three paintings below. Yeah. Um, that's what you call a prompt. Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I hadn't realized until I finished my project and all the paintings had come home and so on, that I'd actually painted all three sides of Everest. Everest is basically triangular, if you look at it from the top. Um, and so I painted the southwest face, which is in Nepal. I painted the north face, which is in Tibet, and the east face, which is in Tibet. Now, the east face has been seen by very, very few people, let alone it's been painted by nobody else. Um, and uh, very difficult to get to. It's very hard to climb the east face uh, to, to get a, to summit from there. Although I, I do have a friend, Stephen Venables, who is the only Englishman who's ever done that, and he did it without oxygen. Um, but anyhow, um, very few people have ever seen that face. Um, the, the one in the middle is the face that you see from Tibet, the southwest face, and the one on the left is the north face, which you see from, uh, from Tibet. Uh, and um, so when I got home and I thought, wow, I don't, I don't suppose anybody else has ever painted all three faces of Everest. So I got onto the Guinness Book of Records and uh, said, has anybody else ever done this? And if not, I'd like to claim the record. And they said, well, as far as we know, nobody else has ever done it. But um, you can't claim a record because we only give records for things that other people can achieve or can surpass. <laughs> and the fact that you were the first person to do it means that I can never be surpassed. Nobody else can ever be the first. And so therefore, we can't put it in the Guinness Book of Records, <laughs> which, which I thought was a great shame. But there we are. It's just, uh, that wasn't why I did it. I didn't even realize I'd done it until I got home and thought about it. So it wasn't what I was trying to achieve. It simply, it simply was rather a rather nice thing to learn. And we think that the painting in the middle is the highest elevation that somebody has completed, a large, complete artwork like that. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. That's right. Yes. And uh, the souvenir on that piece has a little glass vial of what is now water, but where is that water from? Oh, well, it, yeah, it was from the glacier that was coming down here, and it, of course it was frozen when I got it, but it uh, didn't stay frozen when I got it back home. Uh -huh. And uh, another unusual thing about uh, the works, which are all also at the museum, is the piece on the right shows some prayer flags, and it's pretty unusual for Tony to incorporate um, man-made elements in your artworks. That's true, because, because my work's all about wilderness, really. Um, and wilderness implies that at least uh, there are very, very few people living it and, and making very little uh, dent in the place. Um, I very seldom, in fact, I think almost never put uh, structures, human structures in the work. Um, and, but in this case, as I say, the Buddhist religion was such an important, or philosophy was such an important part of the trip that uh, it just seemed appropriate to put that in. And of course it is to show you, the, it, it was to show you the, the um, it is to show you the, the cairns which they, the, the local guys use in order to get their yaks down into that green there to feed the yaks. So that's, it's sort of quite hospitable down there at the right season, but not when we were there really. We were the first people to get there that year. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to read that, don't you? Yeah, this is a great inscription that shows... Uh, now, when the watercolors are little, they're kind of notes and shorter uh, thoughts. But this is one of the large artworks that's uh, on exhibit here. It's about four feet by six feet. And um, we were hoping Tony could read this. It's almost yeah. like a short story well, well, poem. Yeah, because um, what I should explain is I write my diaries every night. And my diaries are, you know, little red notebooks. And they... Whether you want to write it or not, you know, in your tent, you're freezing cold. The last thing you want to do is lie there and write 
your diary, but I religiously do it because it seems to me that a diary has to be done every day, otherwise it, it, it loses its kind of immediacy and, and its point. Um, and so I write my diaries every day, and, and so, you know, sometimes two or four, five, six pages about the day. But, but the notes that I put on the paintings are a distillation of, uh, of, of everything that I've written about that particular trip. Uh, and so in this case, um, it says, searching for sight for a small painting, I find a large one. The receding hues create a symphony in blue, which is why I put that sort of those that line of blue test blues along the bottom there. And in fact, I never quite achieved that idea of the symphony in blue, which I was hoping to achieve. But it turned into a nice painting anyway. Um, lash the board to trees and rocks at the very edge of a steep cliff. Start drawing. Stop at dusk when the temperature plummets to 26 degrees Fahrenheit. October the 15th. Start painting. The paper constantly covered in dust in strong cold wind. Two ravens courting, croaking affectionately, they fly aerial aerobat, aerobat, aerobatics, circling on the thermals inches apart. You know how ravens do that? They do that lovely thing where they, when they're courting, they, they make this lovely noise and, they, and, they, and the acrobatics are just fantastic. Um, October the 16th, so far only the top three inches of landscape completed. I'm daunted and despondent. October the 18th, a good early morning sky, fleeting cirrus and some colour. October the 19th, a visitor on muleback, accompanied by a string of minders, destroys the solitude. I am alerted to his importance by the hearty laughter that greets his feeble jokes. <laughs> he views the canyon briefly, is photographed looking masterful, and departs, the Secretary of the Interior. <laughs> October the 23rd, a bobcat stands on the trail. We stare impassively at each other before it glides into the oaks that dot the landscape. Its colouring so perfect, it immediately disappears. The painting resolved, I make notes, pack, and leave at dusk. So that's just what you see and hear when you're sitting for a while uh, doing a painting of that sort of size. <laughs> Tony makes notes about the types of clouds, which reminds me the uh, I've heard you say the clouds and the sky are a key element in your artwork, that even when you're there for days, you wait for some sky that inspires yeah, you. Yeah, that's true. Um, the sky, of course, is the key to color. Uh, and, but if, you, if you, all you've got is a blank blue sky, that's almost impossible for a watercolorist to paint because uh, you know, doing a flat wash when you're out in the, in the, in the back country is nearly impossible. And doing a big flat wash is really impossible. And so I, I wait until I get the sky. Um, and sometimes that might be halfway through doing the painting, which is a bit of a nuisance because you then do this wonderful sky that, you suddenly, that has suddenly appeared. Uh, and, and then all the hues that you've got so far are probably a bit off. And so you have to readjust them to make them match the sky that you've suddenly painted. Um, but I, tr I try not to invent stuff, that's the point, really. And here you are, back in your studio in Tyrodrith, Cornwall, England. So you have, I think one of the brave things that Tony does, he spends all this time on site uh, painting all these works, rolls them in his aluminum tube, and then sends them home. That must be nerve-wracking to send them away and <laughs> relief when you receive them yeah. uh, off the airplane or whatever in, um, back in England. So you unroll them, uncurl them, and finish them on, in your studio. And I'm curious how you complete the paintings, just going by the notes you've written on the artworks, um, but more typically notes are color references and shadow references, but sometimes they are um, I guess, humorous notes or whatever. There's one memorable note to self that he wrote that says, sort out this mess, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call that humorous. I'd, yeah. call, I'd call that frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, he did sort it out, so it looks great. Humorous now. Uh, and maybe you can talk about how much of each paintings of the paintings are completed on site. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I would say that there are about two thirds, two thirds completed on site. Um, and a third in the studio. Though, funnily enough, the time in the studio takes longer. Uh, but in terms of square inches, they're about two thirds finished on site. 
but what happens in the studio is that you're resolving the thing to make it work as a work of art. Uh, and so, in other words, the foreground has to come forward, the, the background has to recede, the, um, the eye catcher that you've uh, discovered where you want the people's eye to finally track to, uh, you know, you make sure that that's, that's understandable. Uh, and sometimes people come to my studio and they look puzzled at what I'm doing. And then I know that I haven't actually managed to resolve the thing so that it's readable by other people. I know what it's supposed to look like, um, but other people sometimes don't. And so the work in the studio is to make that painting uh, understandable to other people so that it seems to work in three dimensions. Um, and you can see uh, that um, my studio wall is covered in, in all the stuff that I bring back from places. Um, and that really, uh, there are 40 years of collected garbage, really. Um, well, not garbage, but, 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 you know, bits of tree bark, bits of dust, uh, bits of odd things that I happen to come across. There's a, there's a dehydrated um, puffer fish from... The, from uh, the Baja Peninsula, there's a, the odd skulls and things that I've found of, of animals and birds. Or, uh, also, uh, just anything that, it, that catches my attention. Uh, the wing bone of a pelican. I don't know, just some lovely things, really. But, and they stick on my wall, and then when I'm doing the painting, I, I, they're all carefully filed. So I go along and I think, oh yeah, that's what was present, or that's what I took from that particular spot. And I put that then into the painting if it seems to suit it. Um, and I suppose the point of those is, in a way, to prove that I've been there. You know when you're a kid and you went to Paris and you picked up a French cigarette packet and brought it home? Well, I've just grown up doing it, that's all. Um, and, and in a way, many of my souvenirs aren't nearly as interesting as that French cigarette packet, but, but on the other hand, they do say something about the place where I've been. And then you carefully inscribe your journey notes onto 12-ply rag mats, which would be a little nerve-wracking, too. He has beautiful handwriting, very neat, um, easy-to-read notes. And then the artworks are framed, pre prepared for exhibition, and sent out from your uh, hometown and, um, and exhibited. So this particular journey uh, was first exhibited in 2008 at the Royal Cornwall Museum in Truro, England, and also then at the Royal Watercolor Society in London, England, and then continuing 2008 through 2009 at three different Gerald Peters galleries in Santa Fe, then Dallas, and New York, and also in 2009 at the Phoenix Art Museum. And I'm wondering if you could describe what it was like when you first saw all of these artworks that you worked on outside and in your studio up on a wall all together and mm. presented? Yeah, that's a good question because, of course, while, while I'm working on this body of work in my studio, it's all piling up and people are coming in to see it and people are getting more and more excited because, you know, the, work, the works are uh, beginning to look resolved and, and, and then, they're fr then they go to the framers. Well, once they've gone to the framers, these big things, I can't get them back in my studio. My studio is too small. It's up some wiggly stairs. Uh, and so I never really see them again as my pictures. Um, while they're in my studio, they're mine. And, and I love them. But the van come, the, they go to the framers. The van comes, or the lorry comes, takes them to the gallery. And they're no longer mine. They, they then are launched in the world. It's like, I guess it's like saying goodbye to your children. Um, and so I see them in the gallery, and they don't seem to be mine. And I, at first, I sort of think, OK, well, that's pretty much what I was hoping it would look like. Um, and, but I still have this uh, attachment to them where I can see the fault in every single painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, that, that, so then and I'm sort of critical. And I think, oh, yeah, I could have done that foreground a bit better. I could, that rock there doesn't work. Or you know, that, that river doesn't sparkle as much as I hoped it would. Um, uh, but then, coming to see them here has been really super for me because um, that great big painting that nearly killed me, um, I always had a very mixed feeling about that because I can remember when I brought it home back to Tywa Dreth in Cornwall, my, where I live, um, I couldn't unroll it. Um, and after about three weeks, my wife said, are we actually going to see this picture? And I said, no, it's rubbish. It's just a catastrophe. 
And she said, oh, come on, let's have a look at it. And we unrolled it on the floor, and we both went, whoa, <laughs> that's really nice. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I still have, ha, still have that's the that, painting. That's the that painting attachment the to it, that, that, uh, that, um, it had, that it had nearly killed me. And, and it had been probably a foolish endeavor on my part. Um, but now seeing it here, what, 12 years later, um, I looked at it and thought, wow, that's a fantastic painting. Um, <laughs> and so, I, so I, I've loved seeing the show here because it's been some, many of those paintings I haven't seen for 12 years, and, and it's, it's really nice to see them again. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's powerful to see so many together. So, of course, you've been continuing creating artwork and journeys since 2008. Sure. And I want to take the opportunity to encourage people to visit the Foster in Palo Alto, California. This is a very unique museum dedicated to sharing Tony's powerful exhibitions of watercolor journeys to inspire reflection, discussion, and education about art, wilderness, and the natural world. And um, it's open daily and with free admission. And inside, we have two photographs showing two of the galleries. Uh, it's 14,000 square feet. And inside, we have uh, now a retrospective gallery showing one artwork from 15 different journeys that Tony's taken previously. And uh, the 15th complete journey of 32 artworks, all focused on sacred places of the American Southwest. And uh, the 16th journey, which is 52 artworks, exploring beauty, watercolor diaries from the wild. Those are artworks from around the world, and they include a very large painting of the Grand Canyon and more paintings of, from Nepal and Tibet. Uh, and also interesting underwater studies. So I want to encourage you to if you're a Tony fan, come to California and see more. And we email out a monthly newsletter with information about happenings at the Foster and also happenings with the artist Tony. Uh, and if you're interested in receiving it and don't currently receive it, we have a sign up right at the exit. Uh, so thank you, Tony, for sharing your thoughts and your stories about creating this masterful collection of artworks. And thank you to our audience for coming to hear about Tony's journey, searching for a bigger subject. We have time for a couple of questions. Oh, okay. That lady had her hand up first, I think. I have two questions. Two questions, okay. Did you ever take photographs of where you were painting to look at it from your home to uh, remind yourself? No. Nope. And secondly, what do you do with your hands when your painting is so cold? No, this is uh, the first question um, do I use photographs when I'm painting? The answer no. Um, I rely on my memory, I rely on the notes that I make in pencil on the paintings themselves. Um, and uh, I do take a camera with me, but I only take snapshots really of my pals sitting by the campfire or, you know, having a miserable time. Um, <laughs> uh, so so th that's what I use photographs for, but I never use them in my work. I've got no philosophical objection to the people using photographs. I think people make some perfectly fine pictures using them. Uh, it's just that I can't. I find that there isn't enough information in a photograph to be any use to me whatsoever. Um, second question, what was it? What do you do for your hands? Oh, yeah. How do I keep my hands from freezing? Uh, that's a very good question because I don't actually know the answer. I remember when I was painting this picture. Uh, I was up at, that's painting the North Face. My friends had all been up to Camp 2 and they'd come down and they were completely muffled up, huge mittens um, and wearing, you know, the appropriate clothing. Uh, and I, although I'm sort of muffled up with, with a down jacket and so on, uh, I've only got, on this hand, I've got uh, a little thin uh, glove uh, with my thumb stuck through my paint box, because that's how it works. You stick your thumb through the, the little hinge at, at the back. Oh, maybe I won't show you, take too long. Um, uh, and this hand, was a, uh, a, a glove where the ends of the first two fingers and the thumb had been cut off. And it was about minus 10, I think, uh, centigrade. So that's about, what, 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and they said, how the hell are you sitting there? I've been there all day. How the hell are you sitting there all day still painting with, you know, with naked fingers? And I, I said, oh, I don't know. 
Um, well, I have a tea break every two hours, and I warm my hands up on my <laughs> mug of tea. But, that, but I honestly don't know the answer. And if you ask me to go and sit out in a field, you know, at, at 12 degrees Fahrenheit for eight hours, uh, you know, just sitting there, I would, I would say, you must be crazy. Of course I'm not going to do that. I'll get hypothermia. <laughs> there's, there's something about concentrating, I think, I don't know, that, that uh, meant that I didn't freeze to death. I don't know why. Um, so that seems a silly answer to, a, to an intelligent question. But I honestly, I've often pondered that, and, and uh, I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Have you ever done the Annapurnas? Annapurna. Yeah, I have done Annapurna, yes. Machu Picchu. In fact, um, uh, that last picture of the inside of the foundation, the picture on the right-hand side was Machu Picchu. This one. Oh. You can't really tell that, but I know that's what it is. And then the three further down are on my way up to Annapurna Base Camp. So yes, I have. Yeah, <laughs> that was my fourth trip to the Himalayas. The night picture is if it opened here. She said that you were uh, diving over a great coral reef. How did that go, and where is that going with your painting? Mm. Oh, your trips to the Maldives. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, I was. That's true. I was. <laughs> Yes. Um, my wife, very sensible woman, um, uh, she doesn't come with me on any of my journeys. Uh, She's she got far too much sense. Um, but when I was doing the exhibition about uh, exploring beauty, I asked all sorts of luminaries, what I called luminaries, people like David Attenborough, uh, Stephen Venables, uh, Robin Hanbury Tennyson, people who are used to being out in the backcountry, explorer, climber, um, a broadcaster, of course, about wild places. I asked them all to nominate the most beautiful wild place they'd ever seen. And I would, my job was then to go and paint it. Um, and they, uh, their job was to nominate it and then write a piece about why it was the most beautiful wild place they'd ever seen. Well, David Attenborough, first of all, didn't want to nominate somewhere because he thought that, that as soon as he nominated it, it would be immediately invaded by swarms of tourists who would destroy it. Uh, and, then, and then he thought about it some more, and he said, I have thought of somewhere, underwater coral reefs. Um, why don't you do paintings of those? And I thought, oh, OK, I've got, to, <laughs> I've got to figure out a way to do that. So I then, made, I then worked out a way to do it. I've, I've been a scuba diver since I was about 25. Um, and I simply put on an extra weight belt, or put on extra weights. I had a plastic uh, drawing board and a strap to my wrist, a plastic drafting film clipped to it, uh, and Karan Dash crayons. And I would sit on the bottom and do drawings of the fish and the corals and all those lovely things. And the fish at first would kind of come up and, you know, what are you doing here? But then after a little while, I would just sit there working, and they would all get on with their lives. And, and it turned out to be a perfectly successful way to make drawings. I would then make paintings from the drawings. So that's the only time I ever use what you might call sketches, really. Um, and so I'd do these three foot square, or I think that's the biggest one, maybe four feet square, uh, paintings of just underwater coral scenes. And they are exotically beautiful, I've got to say. Uh, and the fish just look fabulous. And, 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 and uh, um, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have dreamt up doing such a thing, really, had it not been prompted by someone like David. But um, anyhow, so yeah, so the answer was, um, I was diving uh, when the exhibition opened. Unfortunately, the coral reefs are now terribly bleached, uh, and have many of them destroyed by global warming, uh, by the seas heating up, and the, the corals just can't stand um, the temperature of the sea going up by a degree or two. And so, although occasionally, I've been back a few times, and occasionally you see that some corals are regrowing, obviously it's very slow, but big corals like the el elk horns and the stag horns, which are the re really important ones that provide a lot of shelter, um, are pretty much gone. And the fish, too, are much, much less than they used to be. It's tragic. Tragic. One thing I wanted to add is Tony's very comfortable under the water, so he has a scuba tank, but he doesn't use up that much oxygen, so he can stay down there drawing for an hour or more, I think. Yeah, more. 80 minutes, 85 rise. minutes. But of course, you have to have a buddy with you mm -hmm. most of the time, although if you can persuade the dive master to let you just sit there, after he realizes that you're quite comfortable and competent, generally he lets you just sit there. Um, and I was, remember I was painting in Little Cayman, and um, there was a snorkeler passed over where I was sitting, 
And um, she rushed to the boat and said, there's a dead man down there. And, <laughs> and the boatmaster said, really? Why? What, what's happening? She said, there's a guy who just seems to be sitting there, and, uh, and he must be dead. And, they, and the dive master said, is he blowing bubbles? And she said, oh, yeah, I think he was blowing bubbles. And they, and they said, oh, it's all right. It's only Tony doing some drawing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Should we join the gallery? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Doing such a large painting over 10 days or more, how do you resolve the consistency of shadow and light? Yeah, good question. How do I resolve the light changing while I'm doing a painting over a period of several days? Um, and the answer is that with the big painting in particular, um, the drawing, I do very careful drawings. Um, and the drawing is, I consider that sort of scaffolding for the work. Uh, and the drawing on some of those big paintings might take three or four days. And I haven't started painting yet. And so during that time, I've seen the sun go from dawn till dusk three or four times. And I know by then when the scene looks at its best. So it might be 8 o'clock in the morning, it might be 6 o'clock at night, but, or it might be midday, though that's unlikely. Um, and so I've seen that happen, and I think, OK, well, I'll set the painting at that time. So I'm painting all day, doing the, the, um, the underpainting and the, and the color and so on and so on. And then when it, when it gets to the point where the shadows are where I want them to be, I then just lay them in on top of what I've already done. And so, um, and so that then sets the rule about how the painting is going to look when it's finished. Because you, know, you can't have the shadows coming from one direction one side of it and the other direction the other side so everything has to follow that law then once you've set that down so it's a matter of just looking carefully really uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in, uh, in the watercolor to begin with it was this like a lifelong passion uh, I wouldn't say that but um, I'm self-taught I've never been to art college um, I wish I had I'd have got to where I am now a lot quicker but <laughs> but um, and so I, I had a bit of a rackety kind of education, really. Uh, I was expelled from school when I was 16. But art had always been the thing that I was best at. I was always top in art at school. But, th but that was considered to be a waste of time. Uh, I was a very formal boys' school. Uh, and the art teacher, uh, this old lady, um, died when I was in the third year at school. And they never even bothered to replace her. And so, <laughs> and so really, I, the school and I fell out badly. And, and I was expelled. And, and then I sort of rattled around for quite a while um, uh, because I had a sort of a troubled period then. Um, and, uh, but I'd always worked. I'd always made art in some way, not watercolour necessarily. Um, and, and so I continued to make art, whatever I did. I worked all sorts of other things, had loads of jobs um, to make a living. Uh, and, but in the end, I got to the point where I said to Anne, my wife, I said, look, I've either got to take this seriously or I've got to give it up because I was spending weekends doing it evenings. It was sort of ruining our lives, really. Um, <laughs> and, and so we saved enough money for me to give up work entirely for two years. And I said, if at the end of that two years uh, I haven't got anywhere, nothing's happened, then I'll give up. Uh, but luckily, in that two years, I wouldn't say I was making a living, but there were enough signs that making a living might be feasible. And so I continued. I, I, I gave up work entirely, never had another job. I've never had to teach. I've never had to, I've never even had to give lectures um, <laughs> <laughs> to earn a living. I've always just lived from my work. And, and I've managed to accumulate around me enough people who appreciate what I do to, to ensure that when I do an exhibition, generally speaking, uh, you know, it sells pretty well. But the watercolour part of it really only developed when I decided that I wanted to do this kind of work. Before I, that, I was a pop artist. And I used to do paintings about bunny girls and, and hot rods and boxing matches and stuff like that. And they were quite successful. I mean, people quite liked them. But uh, on the end, uh, on the, uh, in the end, I got fed up with using second-hand imagery. It's always second-hand imagery with pop art. And I got fed up with that. I, I wanted to create my own imagery. And I thought, well, I ought to paint pictures about what I care about. And I care about the environment. I care about, I enjoy adventures. I enjoy being in the backcountry. Or I enjoy traveling and, and hiking and that kind of thing, camping. 
uh, or used to. I've, I've worked out, I've lived in a tadpole tent now for eight years. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if, if I add it all together, all the times I've spent in a tadpole tent, eight years, and the novelty's worn off a bit, but, <laughs> but, but, um, but nonetheless, um, I realized that if I was going to do that kind of work, which was a, about traveling, working on site, and so on, then watercolor was the only way to do it. You couldn't do it with oil paint, uh, not on any kind of scale, because, of course, insects would stick to it, and dirt would stick to it. It would never dry. It would be too heavy. Oil paints are very heavy. You can't carry lots of them. Uh, and so the way I wanted to work and the way I ended up working kind of came together. Thank you. Any other questions? Looks like we've finished them. Yeah. Good. Should, should we